Um, so next up we have Tom Stewart. Um, Tom has travelled here from London. He was the CTO of FutureLearn, uh, which is an online learning platform. Uh, previously he was doing his PhD at Cambridge, which he assures me is superior to Oxford. <laughs> Um, but he didn't actually complete his PhD because he found the tutoring and lecturing side too interesting to actually finish his thesis. So instead he wrote a book about it instead. Uh, so welcome to Tom Stewart. His, his, it is his second time at RubyConf AU. Woo. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm so happy to be here in this beautiful city, back at this fantastic conference again, so thank you so much for having me. So this is a fairy tale. You're at your grandparents' house, uh, and in the attic you find a dusty old computer, and you plug it in and it boots up and it still works, and it turns out that it runs Ruby. But when you fire up IRB, you realize there's something a little strange going on. You can multiply numbers, no problem, and subtraction works fine sometimes, but if you do something that might generate a negative number, you get this weird error you've never seen before. Zero is the smallest number. And it turns out that this version of Ruby doesn't support negative numbers. That's, that's weird. Um, so here's your challenge. How are you gonna add support for negative numbers on this old computer? And more specifically, what I mean is, how are you going to implement this class that can represent signed numbers, so numbers that are either positive or negative? It has some factory methods for building positive and negative numbers, and a few instance methods for doing some basic arithmetic. And if you implemented that class, you could require it in IRB and define some helper methods to make it more convenient to call those factory methods, and then you'd be able to do stuff like add some numbers and get the right answer, or safely subtract numbers and get a negative answer without anything blowing up, or multiply positive and negative numbers, or compare positive and negative numbers. Now, this isn't a very convenient API, but it's better than having no negative numbers at all, right? So I want you to take a second to think about this. If you were given this problem at work, how would you solve it? Let's start by having a look at the basic form of a signed number. It has a sign, and it has what I'll call a size, its absolute magnitude. And this size is always a positive number, so we can safely work with it on this old computer. So we can start out by implementing those two factory methods to take a number and create an instance with the size that is that number you passed in, and then set the sign to either positive or negative, depending on which factory method you call. And we can represent signs however we want here. I've picked symbols, but you could use you know, Booleans, or you could make your own sign class, or whatever. It doesn't really matter. In the initializer, we're just going to store the sign and the size in instance variables. And we're going to add some getter methods so that other instances of this class can read those two values. So let's start by trying to implement that equals method. As a signed number, if I'm given another signed number, how do I know if it's equal to me? Well, that should be straightforward. We just check that the sign and the size of the other number are the same as mine. And according to IRB, this works fine. Equal positive numbers are equal. Equal negative numbers are equal. If the sizes are different, then those numbers are not equal, so we get false here. And if the signs are different, then they're not equal, so that all works. All right, let's move on to the plus method then. Let's begin by doing the simplest thing possible, which is we leave the sign alone and we add the two sizes together. And that actually works for adding two positive numbers, that's great, and it also works for adding two negative numbers, so that's good. Uh, but adding a positive and a negative number gives us the wrong answer. And what's going on is we were expecting positive two to be the answer here, but the size of the result is actually four. So our implementation should have subtracted the one from the three instead of adding it. So we need to put a conditional around this line of code. If the signs are the same, then okay, go ahead and add the sizes. But if they're different, you need to subtract the sizes. And so now a positive plus a negative works, 
and a negative plus a positive works too. Now let's try one more example. Oh no. If we add positive one and negative three, our subtraction blows up because in this case, one minus three is going below zero and this weird version of Ruby we're using doesn't know how to do that. So this subtraction here only works if the first number is big enough for the result to be zero or more. So we need to guard it inside another conditional. So if we can safely do the subtraction, if the size of the first number is large enough, then okay, go ahead and do it. Otherwise, we have to do the subtraction the other way around and flip the sign of the result and just trust me that this is the right thing to do. <laughs> so now this works and it works if the negative and the positive are the other way around. So it seems like we're done here. So just one final check. Does everything work properly when the result is zero? Oh no, this should be true. Why isn't this true? Well, the positive three plus the negative three is positive zero. Okay, that seems fine. Uh, negative three plus positive three is negative zero. Oh, okay, and we didn't do anything special to make positive and negative zero be equal. But of course, positive and negative zero mean the same thing, they're just zero. So they should be equal despite their signs not matching. So we need to go back to that equality implementation and like make some room to put in a special case here, which is either the signs have to match or the size has to be zero. And now everything works. Okay, so this part of the story is dark and painful, and by looking at you, I can see you're starting to get a little bit frightened, so I'm gonna skip ahead a few pages to get past the scary bits here. So don't worry, <laughs> everything's fine. We do eventually manage to correctly implement all of those operations, and here's the code that we end up with. Here's the equality and addition methods that you just saw. Here's subtraction, which is almost a perfect copy of the addition code, but it's slightly different. And here's multiplication, which is relatively straightforward, actually, and thankfully doesn't have any like nested conditionals or anything like that. And then here's less than, which is a bit of a nightmare. We've got both a nested conditional and this sort of complicated Boolean expression to support negative zero properly. I'll share the Git repo of this at the end so you can solve the problem yourself if you're interested, but don't worry, the details aren't as important as the end result that you can see here. I haven't really given you a chance to understand the code, but even the code itself isn't that important. What's more important is the shape of it. So apart from being quite long, you can see that this code has got a lot of conditionals and you can see that from the indentation itself and in the ternaries that you can kind of spot in line. And we need those conditionals to address the differences in logic depending on the signs and relative sizes of the two arguments. And we need more conditionals to flip the sign between positive and negative in some places. And then we need even more conditionals to deal with various edge cases involving the special number zero. So it's surprisingly complex what seems like it should be a straightforward problem, right? And it's interesting to think about where has that complexity come from? So the point is, this was way too hard. It feels unnecessarily complex given how apparently simple the problem is. So can we do better? And if so, crucially, how? Well, the standard advice here is to refactor by removing duplication or breaking the code up into smaller objects, but in this case, there's a limit to how much that is gonna help us. There's a kind of inherent complexity in all of these different behaviors and edge cases that we need to deal with. If we extract some classes and replace those conditionals with polymorphism, for example, the conditionals will still be there, they'll just be implemented in a different way. And we can only get so far by moving the furniture around like this. The total amount of complexity is conserved. And that's because the source of that complexity is not the problem itself or even the way our code is organized, but actually the naive way we chose to represent negative numbers in the first place. So instead of refactoring, what I'd like to do is start again, pick a different representation of negative numbers and re-implement all those methods according to that new representation. So last time we concentrated on the form of a negative number and split it apart into two pieces. But this time, let's put those pieces back together and consider their intrinsic meaning. We didn't stop to think about this before, but what is negative three anyway? In a sense, it's not a practical idea at all. Like with the counting numbers like one, two, and three, you can hold one apple, two apples, three apples in your hands, but you can't hold negative three apples. You can hold three dollars, but you can't hold negative three dollars. Although. That's an interesting example because your bank statement might say that you have negative $3 in your account if you're anything like me. 
And if you can't actually own negative $3, then what does your bank really mean by that? Well, what they mean is, if you deposit $10, then you'll end up with $7 in your account, right? $3 less than you deposited. Or equivalently, if you deposit $100, you'll have $97, $3 less. So that initial balance is actually the difference between what you deposit and what you have afterwards. And that same meaning is also true for positive balances. If your account balance, balance is positive $3, then if you deposit $10, you'll have $13 in your account afterwards, $3 more than you deposited. And again, that initial balance is the difference between what you paid in and what you ended up with. And that initial balance can be positive or negative, and that determines whether the final balance is larger or smaller than what you deposit. But the amount you deposit is always a positive number. And by making a large enough deposit, you can always make the final balance positive too. And that's useful for us because we're working with a system that only supports positive numbers. So here's a new representation of signed numbers based on that intuition about differences. Imagine two stacks of building blocks, a left stack and a right stack. And together they form a kind of step, a step up or a step down as we go from the left to the right. So here, to go from left to right, you have to step up by two blocks. So that pair of stacks represents positive two. And here's a different representation of positive two. The stacks are different sizes, but it's still a two block step up. And this pair of stacks represents positive three, a step up by three blocks. The number it represents is the difference between where you start and where you finish as you move from left to right. And it's no harder to represent negative numbers like this. We just make a step that goes down instead of up. So this shows a couple of different ways of representing a step down by two and a way of representing a step down by three. But in each case, we obviously have positive numbers of blocks in each stack. They're just arranged to make a step down instead of a step up. Now, this representation exudes a kind of hipster authenticity because we've based it on our kind of sensitive understanding of signed numbers rather than their superficial syntax. But it also has some interesting properties that make it really useful for the problem that we're trying to solve here. Firstly, it has a pleasing regularity that our first representation doesn't have, or I guess you could call it consistency. Here's how we represented a few example numbers as a separate sign and size. Most of them only have one representation, but zero has got two, positive and negative zero. And that means zero is a special value, and then we have to handle that explicitly in our code with a bunch of edge cases. But in our new representation, we have lots of different ways to represent negative two, for example. It's all of the different possible steps down by two blocks. And the same goes for every other number. So that edge case of zero just goes away because zero is no longer special. Every number has multiple representations now, an infinite quantity, actually. So we'll have to cope with multiple representations everywhere and make that a feature of our solution rather than a weird blemish that we want to cover up. Another useful property is that because we have a natural way of visualizing our representation, we can think about it using spatial reasoning, which is a really powerful tool that's already hardwired into our brains. And we can use that visual intuition to design operations on the representation without having to think explicitly about the arithmetic that we're doing. So for example, how do we turn positive two into its corresponding negative number? Well, we really want it to have the same constituent parts, but like the other way around, so that it's a step down instead of a step up. And if these were building blocks in the real world, we could pick the whole thing up and flip it over and drop it back down, and now it's negative two instead of positive two. Here's another example. How do we add positive three and positive two together? Well, thinking visually, what we really want is to combine these two steps to make one larger step. And if these were real blocks, we could physically combine them by picking one of the numbers up and dropping it on top of the other one. And now we've added positive three and positive two to get positive five. The last useful property is compositionality. And what I mean by that is, once we figure out how to do these individual operations, we can easily string them together to make new ones. For example, how do we do positive three minus positive two? Well, instead of trying to subtract it directly, we can turn the positive two into a negative two by flipping it over first, and then we can drop it on top of the other number to add it. And we get the result three minus two is positive one. All right, so it's a great representation, the best representation. So let's actually implement it. We'll use left and right instance variables to store the heights of the left and right stacks, and we'll define getters for them both. 
And then in the positive factoring method, we're saying a positive number is the difference between zero and the size of that number. And we could use anything instead of zero to be the left-hand side, but it doesn't matter, and zero is the most convenient. And likewise, a negative number is the difference between that number's size and zero, a step down to zero instead of a step up from it. So how do we tell if two of these numbers are equal? And we have to be careful here, since each number has got multiple representations. We need to be able to tell when two different representations correspond to the same number. Well, we can discover a neat trick that makes it easy just by experimenting with that spatial reasoning. So let's try comparing two unequal numbers first, positive two and positive three. And the trick is, look at what happens if we turn one of the stacks upside down and drop it on top of the other one. Now they don't fit together properly, so we end up with a kind of uneven shape. In this case, it's a step down. Let's try comparing the same numbers the other way around. If I pick it up and flip it over and drop it, again, we get an uneven shape. This time, it happens to be a step up. But if we compare two numbers that are actually equal, positive two and another positive two, then the two shapes fit together perfectly, and the left and right sides end up exactly the same height, because the identical steps kind of cancel out. It's oddly satisfying. So visually, it's pretty clear how we can tell that two numbers are equal. Flip one over and drop it on top of the other one, and if the numbers are equal, then the left and right stacks of the result will be the same height. So the height of the left stack here is the left part of the red number plus the right part of the green one, because it got flipped over, and vice versa for the right stack. And that's easy to write as code. This just says the same thing as the picture. And when we try testing that equality method, everything just works right. Positive numbers, negative numbers, and zero. I'll spare you the individual IRB examples from before. They just all work. So next, let's look at how we implement less than, because we can reuse the same trick here. This is what we saw when we flipped the second number over and dropped it on top of the first one. Let's forget about whether the numbers are equal and think about whether the first one is less than the second one. Positive two is less than positive three, but it's not less than positive two, and positive three is definitely not less than positive two. So you can see here that we get a step down when the first number is less than the second, and in other cases, it's either flat or a step up. And if I showed you more examples, you'd see the same thing consistently. So that just means that whenever the first number is smaller than the second one, we can add up the height of the stacks in this result, and the right one will be shorter than the left one. And again, we can just write that straight out as code. Again, this just says the same thing as the picture. And again, every example of comparing two numbers just works. So what about adding? Well, we already saw this. Drop one number on top of the other, and then we just need to calculate the heights of the resulting stacks. It's just the two left sides and the two right sides. So that's easy to write down as code, and this makes every kind of addition work. We've already seen subtraction as well. What's two minus three? Well, you flip the second number over, drop it on top. Two minus three is negative one. That's the right answer. And we just need to know the heights. The left side is red left plus blue right, and the right side is blue left plus red right. So let's just write that down. And notice we're not doing any actual subtracting here, so we don't need any conditionals to make it correct. And sure enough, it works for subtracting anything from anything. The only operation left is multiplication, which is more difficult, but I'll give you a really quick taste of how it works. How do we calculate the result of multiplying four by five when they're represented like this? Here we're representing positive four as the difference between two and six, and positive five as the difference between three and eight. So our raw ingredients here are the two, the six, the three, and the eight, and we want to avoid calculating the actual differences so that we don't have to deal with subtraction because it generates conditionals. If we can't multiply those differences directly, then what numbers can we make by multiplying the numbers we do know? Let's lean on that visual intuition again and look at it geometrically. So we can calculate red left times green left, two times three is six, and we can calculate red right times green right, six times eight is 48. Now here's what we want to know, the red difference times the green difference, four fives are 20, but ideally without calculating the four or the five. But fortunately, there are some other numbers that we can calculate here. The red left times the green right gives us the number of blocks in this bottom strip here, two eights are 16. And the green left times the red right gives us the number of blocks in this left-hand strip, three sixes are 18. So putting this all together, if we start with the biggest number, those 48 blocks, and take away that bottom slice, and then add back in the little corner, and then take away that slice on the left, we end up with the number we wanted, 
48 minus 16 plus 6 minus 18 equals 20. But this subtraction is just the difference between two positive numbers, 54 minus 34. Uh, that's this many blocks minus this many. And that difference is something that we can directly express in our representation. So that's how we get to 4 times 5 equals 20 without actually doing that multiplication directly and without having to subtract anything. And if we generalize that reasoning and turn it into code, we get this thing. The difference between left times right plus the other left times right and left times left plus right times right. And then all the multiplications work and we're done. So here's the new code for all of those operations. And again, it's the shape of that code that's more important than the actual code. If we compare it to our first attempt, firstly, it's much shorter, but also it doesn't have any conditionals. There are no alternative behaviors or edge cases. And we had to think a little harder and do some spatial reasoning, but the code is way, way less complicated. And personally, I feel more confident that it's correct. So this is all a fairy tale. There isn't really a computer in your grandparents' attic with a version of Ruby that doesn't support negative numbers. And what I've showed you here isn't the way that negative numbers should actually be implemented on computers anyway. Plus, that second solution is kind of too clever in some ways, and you could argue that the first version is a bit more appealing from a kind of shameless green perspective. So don't take any of this literally, but like all good fairy tales, it has lessons to teach us about the real world. Remember, our second representation helped us because it's nicely regular, it leverages our visual intuition, and its operations are easy for us to compose. So choose your representation wisely. It really matters. I do hope that this example provides food for your brain to think about how such a simple design choice in such a simple problem can have such a significant effect on how complex the resulting code has to be, both in its like subjective complexity, like how difficult it is to work with and how many weird edge cases you have to think of and account for, and in its cyclomatic complexity, which is how many different execution paths it has because of conditionals. This is a toy problem, obviously, but the idea applies equally well in real-world code. The better you understand the meaning of the underlying domain, and the better your representation matches that meaning, the easier the resulting code is going to be. Now, it might have seemed like I pulled that second representation out of thin air, but it's totally standard. You could have found it just by going to the Wikipedia page about negative numbers. So you don't necessarily need a blinding flash of insight. Sometimes you can just do some research and see how other people, or sometimes mathematicians, have thought about the problem. If you're interested in the specifics of this negative number problem, I really encourage you to work through it at your own pace and discover the details for yourself. I think it's a fun puzzle. Maybe that's just me. Anyway, do clone this repo and follow the instructions if you fancy it. That's all I've got. Thank you very much for your attention. Enjoy the rest of the conference.